Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, welcome. I'm Kevin Schofield. I'm here to introduce and welcome David Cord Marie, who's visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. David is here today to discuss Borrowing Brilliance, the six steps to business innovation by building on the ideas of others. Borrowing Brilliance challenges our notions of intellectual property and authorship, explores the evolution of a creative idea, and takes us step by step through Marie's own unique thought process, which combines analytical and non traditional thinking techniques. Marie's six-step borrowing process is one that anyone can master to build business innovation. Creativity is not the result of divine intervention. It's something that can be learned and is easily within reach. David Cord Murray began his career as an aerospace engineer working on the conceptual development team for the International Space Station. He's also been an entrepreneur, inventor, and Fortune 500 executive. He was the head of innovation for Intuit and has held similar positions at other Fortune 500 companies. And he's very proud that his book, has made it onto the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming David Cord Murray to Microsoft to discuss borrowing brilliance. Cool. Thanks, you guys. It's good to be here. I was at your Cambridge facility uh, last week, so I'm like, yeah, which is a real. I don't know if you guys have been there, but it's a really cool um, facility. So. First of all, a couple ground rules maybe for, uh, for this meeting. I'm OK with you guys interrupting me, questions. Um, I got in Cambridge, I got a lot of challenges, um, and I'm fine with that. Um, I, think I, I think I can handle most of them. I'm sure you guys might come up with a new one, but that's OK. Um, let me tell you what this book is about and maybe what it's not about, because there's a, there's a couple of misconceptions. It's about creative thinking. Um, this book started, um, as Kevin was saying, I was the head of innovation at uh, Intuit. And it's like, okay, what is the head? Do you have a position like, is there a position like that at Microsoft? Yeah. Well, what happened was I was consulting um, for Intuit, um, working, uh, doing some work on some new products and some new marketing programs. And I came up with this um, um, kind of an obvious idea. Um, and it was so obvious that the founder of the company, Scott Cook, came to me and he's like, how did we miss that? Like, how did you come up with that idea? And I kind of explained to him this, my thinking process, which is what I'm going to explain to you guys. And he said, well, that's really cool. He's like, you need to come here, be the head of innovation. Like, you can be our, the idea guy, kind of po po poke your nose into a bunch of different places. Um, and, you know, maybe, um, and also teach us about creative thinking. And that's really what led to the book that most of you are holding in your hands now. Um, there were two questions that Scott asked and that I tried to answer in the book. The first one is, can creativity be taught? And the second one, is there a process to innovation? Um, the answer to the first question, I felt, was definitely. Um, not only can you teach creativity, but once you understand the basic mechanics of creative thought, you can actually practice it and get better at it. Um, the second question is, is there a process to innovation? Um, and the answer to that one was a little bit more difficult. It was, well, it was more of a yes and no. Yeah, there's definitely a process that we, that we go through to develop a product. There's a process that we go through to maybe come up with a new um, um, you know, marketing idea. But those processes are different, I, I discovered. Like, and everyone, there's a unique way, depending upon your problem, um, there's, a, there's always a unique way that things happen and things flow. Um, I think there are elements to the creative process. Um, are there six steps, like I say in the, the subtitle of my book? Not really. Um, the sixth step is an iterative step. It's taking the first five and, um, and repeating them. And the order in which you repeat them will depend upon your situation. Um, actually, I forgot to change my slides. I was at Boeing this morning. Um, and I actually began my career at Boeing. And I, this is kind of a funny story. That's actually me there in the middle, 30 pounds lighter, full head of hair. Um, this was my first job out of, 
um, college was working on the MX missile. That's the MX missile sitting behind me. Um, so I gave my speech at Boeing this morning, and after this, it was a group probably about this size. Um, and after the speech, this guy comes up to me and he's like, "Do you remember me?" And I'm like, "No." And he's like, "I'm the guy second in on that picture." He goes, "You hired me. That was my first job out of college too." And I'm like, "Oh my God, Bill, where have you been?" And he's still there. Yeah. So I had my I had a little family reunion this morning. Um, so let me. I'm gonna. What I want to do is I want to talk about the six steps. Um, I think about that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk at, um, go over them real quick at a high level, um, and then maybe dive a little bit deeper on each one. And again, feel free to challenge, ask questions. Um, I break these steps into two separate areas, and I think of them two separate. The first one, and I think of them um, using kind of two different metaphors. The first one um, is a construction metaphor. And in that metaphor, I think of an idea the way maybe an engineer or an architect thinks of a, a building and constructing a building. In that metaphor, the problem, the first step, the, defining a problem, is the foundation of an idea. Borrowing materials, going out and borrowing ideas, are, are the materials that then in the third step, Combining is how you construct. Um, and let me give you an example. Uh, well, since I was at Boeing this morning, the example I threw out at them was um, Isaac Newton in calculus. Um, Isaac Newton dabbled in between a bunch of other things he did. Um, he dabbled in mathematics. And along the way, he created the subject, the domain of calculus. And the way that he did that was first he defined a problem. Does anyone remember what the problem was? Come on, nobody remembers their calculus. The, um, actually, there were two problems. It was the area under a curve and the tangent to a curve. Those were the two problems that created the domain of calculus. Then what he did is he went out and he borrowed existing materials and existing ideas to solve that problem. In this case, it was analytical geometry, um, algebra, and infinitesimals, which was actually a new branch of mathematics. He combined those in a, in a unique way that nobody had combined them before and he created calculus. Um, but it, it, in this process, the, those are the very basic building blocks of creative thought. Um, an idea can become incredibly complex. The process of going through and doing this can be incredibly complex because most ideas are more than just a couple things combined. There's multiple, maybe even hundreds of things that will combine and form in, in an, into a new idea. Um, but those are what I consider the mechanics of creative thought. I, and in, in the book, I call it, it's the first part of the book, and I call it the origin of a creative idea. The second part is the evolution of a creative idea. Um, there's lots of misconceptions about creativity and about ideas themselves. And um, perhaps the biggest one is that an idea will pop out of your head fully formed. And that's just not the way it happens. Ideas have to evolve. You have to constantly be working on them uh, and fixing them. And I call that the evolution of an idea. And I've broken that into three steps. The first one is incubation. That's where you involve the subconscious. You know, creative thinkers um, are subconscious thinkers. Most of this, most of what you are going to do um, in creating ideas is gonna happen in the shadows of your mind. And you're, by the way, your mind is really, really good at this. Since ideas are about combinations, um, you know, a half a dozen things will permeate into millions and millions of possible structures on how to put something together. It's literally impossible to do this consciously. But your subconscious behind the scenes, how it exactly does it, I don't know. Nobody really knows. But you can see it. You can see the input going in and the, and the ideas coming out. And, and I've studied a lot of my ideas. Sometimes they seem like they're wow, I don't know where the hell this came from. And as I start kind of breaking it apart, I'm like, oh, you know what? I guess I must have borrowed this from here, this from there, that's there. So what you're doing in that um, incubating, putting your ideas away, is you're doing those first three steps. You're defining problems, you're borrowing materials, and then combining them. Um, the next step is judgment. And that is critiquing the idea. Um, you can't... 
It's, it's the judgment of, a, of an idea that drives the evolution of it. That's what gives an idea its muscle. Um, now, I don't know if you guys have a formal brainstorming process in here, um, but I've worked with a lot of different companies and kind of facilitated these brainstorming things. And brainstorming itself is a concept um, that was created by Alex Osborne, who was an um, advertising executive. Um, and one of the rules of brainstorming is no judgment of ideas. And somehow, I think that got misinterpreted that judgment in the creative process is a bad thing. And it's actually just the opposite. Um, you know, like I said, my experience in facilitating those types of brainstorming sessions is you get really interesting ideas, but they're kind of trivial and they don't have a lot of meat to them. Because it's, yeah. Uh, but judging, huh? We've used uh, things uh, known as ritual descent. So you actually build into the program that people have they've got a viral impact in a group to yep. actually just challenge yep. that is ritual descent. That's great. That's great. I mean, as a creative thinker, you need to welcome that dissent. And, um, and in the book, I talk about judgment as not being, it's not necessarily the acceptance or rejection of an idea. It's actually a viewpoint. And it's multiple viewpoints. And that's how you use judgment. In other words, you, you put your positive hat on and say, OK, what do I like about this idea? And then you list out the attributes that you like about the idea. And then you put your negative hat on. And you say, what don't I like about this idea? What is the weakness in the idea? And you list those attributes. And then, it's, then you go to the next step, which is enhancement, which is where all your creativity is taking place, which is just repeating in some order those things. And it's eliminating your weak points and enhancing the strong ones. It's really important in, when you do that judgment that you include positive. Because what will happen is you'll start to fix your ideas, but you'll tend to eliminate the good things while you're eliminating the bad things, because they're usually um, intimately uh, connected. So does that make sense? What I want to do now is kind of dive a little bit deeper into each of um, I do. A, um, I have a consulting business um, um, in. The, so I go into a lot of different companies and kind of lead them through concept development. And I would say the biggest bang that I get for my buck working with companies where, where, um, um, where maybe they stumble a little bit is right here, is in the problem. Um, you know, I, th I must have read three or 400 um, creativity innovation books. And every, most of the books will, will um, will talk about the fact that, yeah, ideas are solutions to problems. Um, but they don't spend much time on the problem. Um, and really, the science of, of creating or um, um, identifying problems. Um, and there's a few things that, that I kind of learned. And you guys, you guys may or may not um, be good at this part, but I break it into three different things. Um, the identification of a problem. Uh, at Intuit, we had a follow me home program where we would go to customers' um, locations and watch them using our products. And I suspect you guys probably have some, something similar to that here. But basically what we're doing is we're looking for um, you know, problems that they're having so that then we can iterate our solutions. Um, the second part is understanding uh, the problem. That's Asking why, finding the root cause. And the third part is describing the problem. And you know, one of the questions I get, is there a right way to describe a problem in the creative process? And the answer is, well, yeah, there, there, there is, but there's probably multiple ways. And how you describe the problem and how you will define it will determine how you'll solve it. And sometimes it's just changing just the language of how you think about a problem that can lead to a big innovation. Let me, let me give you an example. Um, in the 1920s, Henry Ford um, had defined his problem as, as building the least expensive um, car in the world. And he was very good at that. And every, everything in the company was kind of built around solving that particular problem. And he grabbed 80% market share by solving that problem. While William Durant over at General Motors looked at that problem, and he said, let's define this a little bit differently. And he said, instead of let's build the least expensive car, he said, let's build a car that people can afford. And by just changing it, at first, at first blush, that seems like it might be the exact same problem. But by just 
changing his perception of it by changing the definition of it, it led to a huge innovation that allowed them to take almost half of Ford's um, market share. And that innovation was GMAC, was um, selling cars through monthly payments. And it was just that little bit different um, way of looking at it. There's also another, um, I think, a, another mistake in uh, problem solving that we make is we think of problems in isolation. And they're not. There's a whole hierarchy of problems. And as we set out to solve them, we have to understand where we are in the hierarchy and what that hierarchy is. And where in the hierarchy do we begin or where do we want to concentrate um, on our problem solving? And let me give you another. I'll give you another um, car example. Um, your boss comes to you and says, um, our customers are losing the keys to their car. You need to solve that problem. So you could take that problem in isolation and defining it that way, you'd come up with ideas like a really big keychain, uh, maybe a keychain that like I, I clap and it'll clap back to me like, you know, a clapper thing. You can imagine all the different ideas that would you, you would come up. But what, what I teach is what you want to do is you want to look at what, where that is in the hierarchy. So you want to look above that. What's the problem that sits above the, the um, the uh, losing the keys problem. Um, and the way that you look above is you say, okay, this problem is a solution to what? In the case of the keys, it's a solution to starting the car. So now I've, now I've gone up a level and, I, and now I could ask myself, okay, is there another way to solve that problem? For example, you know, maybe creating a keypad or a friend of mine just got a new BMW and he's got some kind of clicker thing. That he doesn't even have a key. I'm not sure what the hell he's doing to get, to get into his car. Um, but the point is, as you're looking at your problems, always look above and always look below because every solution will create a new, a new series of problems. You know, I think we were talking about, um, before this meeting, we were talking about uh, Quicken and, and money. And I know, um, you know, Quicken, when it, when it was first launched, was a great product. I mean, it, it, it founded into it, really. Um, and they, was, they were solving a very specific problem, which was balancing your checkbook. But then over time, they started solving all these other problems that Quicken became such a gigantic solution to every, you know, I mean, you could solve world hunger with Quicken. But the problem is you couldn't really balance your checkbook very well. There were other, other solutions came along, like online banking, that just completely obliterated it. The point is, every time you solve a problem, be very well aware of the problems that your solution is creating. Because sometimes, um, I mean, when, in software we call it feature creep, or feature creep, is that right? Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. The borrowing is the gathering of materials. I'm not saying that you, you steal other people's ideas. I'm saying that you can't build you can't build something out of nothing. You have to build it out of some kind of material. And other ideas are those materials. Um, where you borrow those materials from will determine the creative perception of your idea. You borrow from your competitor, you will be perceived as a thief. You borrow from outside your domain, and they'll call you a creative genius. Um, John Nash the um, economist who was uh, depicted in The Beautiful Mind, um, he defined a problem. Um, and his problem was a very complex problem, but an element of the problem that he, that he was working on was how do you make decisions with incomplete information? You don't know, you don't know what this person is doing over here, you don't know what this person is over here, and you're trying to develop a strategy. Um, and, it was an, and this was an economics problem. And one night he's playing poker, with a bunch of his friends, drinking beer, smoking cigarettes, um, and he recognizes that, wait a minute, this is the exact same problem that I'm working with in the economics. I'm making decisions with incomplete information. I don't know what his cards are. And actually what he did was he took poker playing strategies because he recognized the problem was the same and applied them to economics and won a Nobel Prize for that. Um, he's still doing the same thing. He's still going out and borrowing ideas. Um, so what, one of the things that I've developed is I think about this as I take the second step. I've defined my problem. 
I think of the search for materials um, at, on a continuum like this. And let me give you an example. Um, after, after my um, stint at Intuit, the uh, president of TurboTax and I left the company and we started an online tax software business um, that was going to compete with Intuit. Um, so as we developed our new product, we're like, we defined our problem first. And the tech, the tax software, the tax software problem was a problem of creating confidence in the customer. Um, with, on, with online uh, tax software, you pay at the end of the experience. So we had to keep the customer um, engaged. And as soon as they lost confidence in this online experience, they were gone. And they were over to TurboTax or, or their accountant or somewhere. So we knew that was the problem that we had to solve. So the first thing we did is we went to TurboTax and said, what, what things there can we borrow that will solve that problem? And one of the things that we really liked was TurboTax, unlike maybe some of the other tax software um, products, they had one question per screen. And it was very simple. And we're like, that's really cool. Like, you know, if you, when you start putting multiple questions on, the customer starts getting a little bit confused. We liked that. So we borrowed that idea. Then we looked at Yahoo. And we really liked the way they had, at this time, this was six or seven years ago, we really liked the way they had laid out their help center. And we're like, that's really cool. It was very intuitive, right? So we borrowed that and put it on the one, um, um, the one question per slide or per um, screen. Um, and then we, then we, and remember, we kept asking ourselves, this is confidence. So we're looking for people that are, uh, we're looking to borrow ideas from people that are building confidence. So we kept asking ourselves the question, who is making products that um, um, creates an emotion? We kind of switched up the, um, the uh, problem we were solving a little bit. We said it a different way. And as soon as we said that, we we're like, well, wait a minute. That's exactly what um, Hollywood does. They make products that are specifically designed to create emotion. So we, st we started studying movies and how movies were structured. And um, we realized that Hollywood movies, maybe not art movies, but Hollywood movies are highly structured. They have, it's a three-act play. The first act defines, the, defines a, con, a, a conflict, or, or a problem, or a conflict. So the pr protagonist, and it's the first 20 minutes of a movie. The next 60 minutes of a movie is called the, escal is the second act, and the, it's the escalation of a, hey, Andy. How's it going? Um, Andy was actually part of this uh, process that I'm talking about right now. Um, so the, the second act is the escalation of a conflict. Um, and then the third act in a Hollywood movie is, is the um, resolution, the climax of the movie, the solving of a problem. So we took those ideas and we're like, oh, let's build our, let's build our tax product like, out of that. And so what we did is um, we started with a conflict. So, you know, we, we, we created like um, the customer was the protagonist, you know, the IRS was the antagonist, and allowed us to structure the program. So the point being, we start close to home, we borrow materials from there, then we take a step farther. In the book, one of my favorite um, borrowers is uh, Charles Darwin. And I studied his, um, um, you could, you, I actually went online and you could pull up Darwin's notebooks and they survive to this day. And you can follow his thinking process. And you can see how he first kind of studied biology. He took like the ideas of the day. And then he took a step way to like a similar domain, which for him was geology. Geology, biology, geo, yeah, kind of the same. Noticed the same problems. Saw how the um, biologists, or the geologists of the day were <clears throat> solving that problem. And then finally, and this took, this took a long time. Then finally, he went to economics. And it was Thomas Malthus who had written an, uh, a um, political uh, essay about the fight for survival. And he combined all this and created his theory. So he was a really, he was a great, he goes down in the hall of fame of borrowing brilliance. You know, starting close to home, taking a step. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it's, so once you gather the materials, the third step is combination. It's taking that material and combining it in a unique way. There's, there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, I think of, again, using an engineering uh, metaphor, you've got structure and the components that make up the structure. So there's, th there's different things that you can combine to maybe change your structure. 
the, the first thing that I do early on in the process is I try to, I think in terms of metaphors and analogies. Um, because it's a metaphor and analogy, analogy that will change the overall structure. That when the example I gave you of the tax software, we kind of thought of our product in terms of a movie. And that helped to kind of create an overall structure. Um, Disneyland is a good example of a product that was created with an overarching metaphor. And actually, it was, like, it was actually the same metaphor that we happen to use in our, in our tax software product. But Walt created the park, um, and he conceived of the park in terms of a movie, a movie starring the customer. Um, and he didn't use engineers and architects to design it. He used storyboards and storytellers. And he's like, OK, let's start in the parking lot. What is this experience? How is this going to look? You know, he conceived the buildings as sets. The, um, the vegetation as props. And if you go to Disneyland today, they still call their um, employees cast members. They're still cast members. Um, and some of the, and, you know, some, so some of the metaphor still exists to this day. Um, and some of it's very subtle. Uh, my daughter and I have been to Disneyland. We just did our 300th day at Disneyland. We don't live that, we don't live that far. Our goal is 365, so we still have a few years left. But, um, um, if you go to the California park, Disneyland, people have been to Disneyland here? When you walk down Main Street, there's a, um, a, a movie technique that Walt used to design Main Street, and it's called forced perspective. And the first floor buildings are full scale. The second story of the buildings are built um, at 5 8 scale, and the top buildings are built at 3 quarter scale. And that's a, that's a technique that um, set designers use to make the appearance of it being bigger. And what's cool about that as you, as you walk down Main Street is um, it gives you this kind of magical feeling. Um, and I kind of knew that as I, you know, through just after maybe after my 250th time, I kind of discovered that. Um, but my daughter and I went to um, Disney World um, last year, and we had never been to Disney World. And when we first walked into the Disney World Magic Kingdom and walked down the street, I'm like, Something's missing. Like, what's not here? And then we realized they didn't build Disney World. Walt, and I, I blame that on Walt not being there. Walt didn't uh, create, or Walt, Walt wasn't there for the construction of Disney World. Disneyland was his creation. His brother built Disney World. But anyways, it's just that subtle um, overarching metaphor that you can use to kind of structure early on um, in your creative process. You're going to come back to the combining um, um, part of your, when you're enhancing your ideas, and sometimes you'll just replace components, um, and so the overall structure won't change. Uh, the iPod is maybe, or the MP3 player is a good example of innovation through um, just changing components out. The, um, you know, they took, instead of a cassette, uh, they used a Walkman as a overall structure, and instead of a cassette, they used a, um, I guess it began with a little hard drive. You know, then the hard drive got replaced by a, a um, whatchamacallit, a chip. So there's those two techniques. Again, the first one is I try to look at structure. Because if I can change structure, I can have a kind of make a big idea. Does that make sense? So let's go to the next incubating. Like I said, the, most of this is going to take place in the subconscious mind. Your subconscious is much better at doing this. Um, what I'm trying to do in the book, and actually with those first three steps, is to bring out what's happening in the subconscious mind and make it conscious. Um, and practice this. That's where the practice kind of gets in. Because your subconscious, if, you, if you're consciously doing those first, those first three steps, your subconscious is kind of watching and learning. Um, I, just, my, I just taught my 17-year-old daughter to drive a car. Um, which was a very interesting experience. Um, when she first started, she had to consciously um, figure out how much pressure to put on the gas pedal. She was con consciously like, okay, I gotta turn the pin, and then I gotta turn it back. She didn't like get this concept of letting the wheel go, and bam, she's hitting curbs and stuff. But over time, as she consciously got this, her subconscious kind of picked up on it. And today when she drives a car, she's not conscious of the pressure. She's actually learned that. And I think of creative thinking the same way, you know? I'm defining a problem, I'm borrowing materials, I'm making combinations. Um, and the more that I do that, the better I get, and the better I get subconsciously doing it. So in this incubation step, that's where an 
I think of this as a relationship with this third kind of shadow, or this second shadow self that exists. Um, and there's three parts to that relationship. There's the input, which that's that conscious thing I was telling you about. And I'm pushing, here's, some, here's the problem, here's the ideas. Maybe I'm, I'm writing them down, um, kind of driving them into my subconscious and, and actually saying to my subconscious, okay, here's the stuff. And then the second part is like, okay, now you go and work at it. Um, and it's, it's a pause. Sometimes it's simple as just a pause in your thinking. Um, sometimes it's sleeping on it overnight. Sometimes it's not thinking about it for weeks. Um, you know, uh, Newton started out thinking about physics and put it away for about 15 years and came back to it. And when he came back to it, he had a whole new insight. You know, something had been going on there in the shadows for a long time. And when he re-brought it up, he had, his subconscious was giving him new things to think about. Um, so, it's, it, has, has everyone ha had the um, aha shower experience? Where that idea pops in your head? You know, as I was writing this book, I was talking to a lot of creative thinkers and I was interviewing people and everybody had the shower experience. And I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. What is it about the shower that is so conducive to creative thought? Um, and then I realized, it's really that third thing, it's output from the subconscious. We all have this disease that is conscious thinking. There's a dialogue going in your head all the time. And you, you know, sometimes the dialogue, we have 30,000 thoughts a day. How many unique 30,000 thoughts you have? You don't have, I mean, of your 30,000 thoughts, I think a high percentage of them are repeated. Um, so, you, you know, it's like, oh my God, what's this guy talking about up here? Or I'm getting fat, my bosses. You all this stuff going on in your head. Um, you have to just shut up every once in a while and give your subconscious some time. Give it a second to think. You can't listen if you're talking. Um, and I think that's what the shower experience is. It's the one time in the day where you kind of relax. You haven't, like, you, know, you're, you haven't got into this constant repetitive thought yet, so you're, you're, you're shut up. You're not talking, and so your subconscious, boop, pops an idea in. So in, in the book, I talk about some really practical ways to kind of recreate that experience. Some of it's just as simple as getting in the habit as when you're talking to you just stopping, you know, thinking, and, and then kind of continue the thinking. Judgment. It's the judgment of an idea that actually drives it, that drives the evolution of it. We talked about brainstorming and how it tends to, it tends to create, or you tend to get these real frivolous ideas from it. Um, that's because there's not that harsh judgment. I was just in um, San Francisco, um, two, well, I guess it was a couple weeks ago now. Um, uh, one of the wire services wanted me to be a commentator for Apple rolling out the new line of iPods. Um, I was like, oh, okay, that sounds kind of cool. And of course, it wasn't really about the new line of iPods they were rolling out. The whole story was Steve Jobs, you know? So I'm thinking, okay, I'm this creative expert. They're going to ask me, like, what do you think of this? How did they develop this? And, you know, I get on the line with, uh, on the um, newswire, and all the questions were, like, what is Steve wearing? Like, how did he look? Like, what's, and it was all about Steve Jobs. Um, and, and Steve... Um, and I know there's, uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of a history here at this company between, the, and I actually write about it in the book, uh, between Microsoft and um, Apple. But one of the things that Steve is particularly good at is recognizing a good idea. Maybe not necessarily coming up with one, but he sure does know a good idea. I don't know if you guys have ever heard the, um, the story of, uh, of uh, Xerox Park when, he, um, when uh, he was there with Larry Tesler. You guys heard this story? Let me tell you this, because it's really interesting. It's really interesting to hear Larry tell the story. Um, but Steve Jobs is a 22-year-old pot-smoking hippie. He's got this little um, hobby computer company, nothing much. He goes to, he, he, he gets uh, a tour of Xerox. Um, and Xerox at the time is on the forefront. It's like the Microsoft research lab of its day, right? Forefront of computer technologies. And Larry Tesler's giving him a um, demo of some new technologies. And he's like maybe five, not even five minutes into the demo, and Steve Jobs is just like, okay, you gotta stop. This is the greatest thing in the world. This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Bob, he's jumping. He's like, we have to, do, why aren't you guys doing any, anything with this? Oh my God. Um, and Tesser tells the story. He's like, you know, I had given this, this demo probably 
five or six hundred times to the captains of industry, to some of the you know, top researchers at Stanford and MIT, and nobody reacted like this. And what, he was, what, he, what Tesla was showing him was the mouse and gooey. And, and he's like, so you ask yourself the question, why did this kid, did Steve Jobs, instantly recognize this technology as being a real breakthrough where all these other really smart people didn't. And my contention is, or my theory is, and, and by the way, Jobs is legendary. That's not, he's legendary at recognizing ideas. Um, and it has to do, I've never worked with him, but I've worked with people that have worked with him. And he's notorious for being very manic, meaning He's extremely positive one moment and extremely negative the next moment. And if you think about this for a second, what this does is this creates creative intuition. Because what you're doing as you're going around and you're looking at ideas, you're, you're, you're laying out, these are the things I really like. These are the attributes I really like. These are the attributes that I don't like. So you've, you're actually able to describe a great idea without even seeing it. And so for Steve, Steve, the difference between Steve and these other 500 people that had seen this demo is he was thinking about this computers in the home where maybe most of the other people weren't. Um, and at the time, as he was doing that, he knew that there was a problem with command-led operations of, of a computer. He's like, we're never going to get housewives or, or um, you know, salesmen to remember all of these commands. You know, most, I, I mean, I was using computers at that time, and I was pretty fast. And like when I first saw a mouse, I'm like, that's stupid. You know, that doesn't do anything for me. But Steve recognized it because he was thinking about the problem differently, and he had this positive and negative thing going. So what he maybe does naturally, like you and I kind of need to do like consciously, and it's putting that positive, putting that negative. That makes sense? Um, You know, I'm, uh, I'm kind of dabbling in some other things now myself, um, and I, I'm writing screenplays. Um, and I don't know, if, have you guys ever heard of William Goldman? He's a, he's a screenwriter. Um, he wrote uh, Princess Bride, one of my favorites, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. He wrote the screenplay, Misery. It was Stephen King's book, but he wrote, and that's one of the, I don't know if you've ever seen Misery and read the book. They're both really good, and that's so unique to get, like, to get a movie and a book that's both really good. But I think it was a great, obviously, a great Stephen King uh, book, but it took the genius of William Goldman to figure that out. Anyways, so I'm studying this, and Goldman is talking um, he talks about the difference in one of his screenwriting books. He talks about the difference between popular Hollywood movies and art films. And he said the difference is in a Hollywood movie, um, Hollywood will tell you, it's not, by the way, you can, have a very, you can have a high quality, according to Goldman, you can have a high quality Hollywood movie and a high quality art film. That's, it's, the difference isn't quality. It's, the difference is in a Hollywood movie, they tell you what you already know. They can do it very creatively, but there's no great insight that you get. You already knew that, and okay, that's why they have happy endings. You know, it's what we want. You know, versus an art move, an art film maybe will change your perception of something. So the reason I'm telling you this is there's probably an unpopular part of my book because as I go and I'm meeting with companies and I'm talking about this, um, everyone's like, okay, oh yeah, six steps, tell us, boom, boom, boom. You know, unfortunately, the six step, this is a trial and error process. Um, creative thinkers will leave a wake of failure. Um, you know, hopefully you can um, um, adjust and get out of the failure, but there are, there is a certain aspect, you know, creative thinking is um, risk taking. So, you know, uh, in when you get to the sixth step, um, which, by the way, creative to think that creative thinking really is six step is a little bit misleading because this step is just reborrowing, recombining, um, restructuring, and sometimes it's just the restructuring of an existing idea that can be a huge breakthrough. In the, uh, for example, in the 1820s. Um, Hans Christian Orsted did an experiment with um, batteries, magnets, and wire. And he ran a current. When he ran a current through the wire, he noticed that um, the compass needle, there was a, a magnetic field 
coming off of the wire. And he's like, well, that's an interesting observation. 20 years later, Michael Faraday took the exact same experiment, except he just restructured a little bit. And he circled the magnets around the wire. Same stuff, same materials, but he circled the magnets around the wire and he created a current. And that was just a huge, I mean, that in the history of you know, innovation and creative thought, that maybe goes down right up there with Gutenberg as a, just a huge idea. But it was just the simple restructuring of something that already existed that created, you know, a, a huge innovation. So it's, you know, when you get to that final step, it's going back, restructuring, reborrowing, um, and enhancing the idea. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Um, kind of for you, like in your organizations. Um, the book that I've written is really about up here and creative thought in your head and what goes on in your head. I didn't realize till, actually till this past weekend, kind of how personal my book is. Um, and I didn't realize, and it's written in the first person, I didn't realize till there's, there's an audio version of the book and I put it in the CD and I hadn't, Listen to the audio version, you know. When I sold the book, Penguin's like, hey, we're going to do an audio version. Do you want to read the book? And I'm like, oh, God, no, I don't want to read the book. So they were like, we'll hire some actor to read the book. And I'm like, okay. So this weekend is the first time I listened to it, and I put it, and I'm driving. And I tell stories in the book, like about my daughter and I doing things, about my own personal experiences of losing a company that I had and how I had to. Anyways, I'm listening to this, and it's this guy reading the book in the first person. I'm getting really offended by this, you know? I'm like, oh my God. Um, so, you know, I, I tell you that because I don't, the book is about the personal journey and the personal creativity. Because at the end of the day, no matter what ideas happen and where they come from, they're going to start inside your head. Um, when we went to, uh, and, and you know, and you got to work them. Um, when when uh, my business partner and I, we, um, when our, with our tech software company, we went through our first, we got through our first tax season, we financed the company ourselves, and then we're getting ready for the, for the second tax season. Um, and we decided we're going to get some venture money. So we go out Sand Hill Road and Palo Alto, and we start making all these pitches. And we, we did pretty well, and we're getting up there. Um, you know, you have to make like to get through two or three like rounds of pitches with each of these big venture capital firms. And I think we were on a third round at Excel Partners. And we walked in and there's, an, there's these two other guys that are pitching their company that day. And so, you know, I, we, were pretty, we were pretty excited. We had real customers. We had real revenue. Um, now we're ready to like really build this thing up so we could sell it to Microsoft. You know, that was kind of our goal. Um, so anyways, I'm sitting there talking to the guy next to me, and I'm like, so tell me about your company. What are you guys pitching? And he's like, well, have you seen that, the website Hot or Not? And I'm like, yeah. This is, this is like seven, six or seven years ago. He's like, well, our, 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 um, our business model is kind of like Hot or Not, except it's like a college yearbook version of Hot or Not. And I'm like, so how do you guys monetize this? Oh, we don't monetize it. And I'm thinking, this is freaking ridiculous. What a stupid business model. Anyways, it's Mark Zuckerberg from uh, Facebook that's sitting next to me. And I tell you that story because, I mean, if you look at Facebook and how it's evolved, they've really gone back and like redefined, I mean, it really did. It started at, I don't know if you guys knew that, but it started as a hot or not site. It was just a complete rip up. But they continued to evolve it, relook at the problems, refocus, add technologies. Um, you know, so again, back to kind of this, this thing, and I'll take some questions. Um, you know, what does this mean? In an organization, I said that you need to separate these different elements um, in different meetings. In other words, have problem meetings. We just sit and define the problems. You build the hierarchy of problems. You redefine them. You think about the problems. You sort and group them. What problems am I missing? Um, you know, and then you have another maybe set of group of meetings that once you decide, you look at that hierarchy, okay, what problems are we going to solve? Okay, now let's send different teams out to look for materials to solve that particular problem. So, for example, if you guys are working on, um, or your product people are working on a, a navigation problem in the software, say, okay, how is Intuit, first thing I would do is, how is Intuit um, um, solving this navigation problem? Great, then maybe I take a step away, how does Google solve their navigation problem? Then I take a step even farther away, how do search and rescue teams solve this navigation, their navigation problems? And then finally, like, how do rats cut in a maze? How do they solve the problem? And gather all that. And working with large groups, 
works really well because you can send a bunch of people out to kind of look at this, and then you bring it all back, um, and then separate, you know, into brainstorming meetings. Which now let's bring all that stuff together, and maybe judgment meetings, enhancement meetings. So, with that said, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, I welcome questions. Yeah. Um, had an experience with uh, crowdsourcing as a part of this. Have you, have you had Wait a minute. I'm not sure. Are you asking me a question? Yeah, have you had any experience or uh, brought the space around crowdsourcing as a part of this sort of... Uh, so I'm not sure what you mean by crowdsourcing. Yeah. Well, uh, the wisdom of crowds um, opening something out. Like to the web. It's uh -huh. like a massively online sure. game, except it's a massively online brainstorm sort of thing. You yeah. Know, that, that sort of stuff. Well, that would certainly be that number two that I have, to grab all of the materials. I think that would be a great way to do it. What else? According to me, it sounds like brainstorm. It's like the combination of That's the com right. and incubation. Right. right. So, the step. Yeah, incubation is kind of a, I, I, don't, I don't suggest we do an incubation meeting, you know, or yeah. kind of just like everybody sit there. But brainstorming, but brainstorming is combining. That's where you're putting this stuff together. But sometimes to define the problems, sometimes you need to brainstorm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, right. Yeah. Some people have argued um, that incubation can be somewhat forced with exercise, time away, you know, things like that. Yep. You know, martial arts, there's certain things that have a certain amount of kind of can help with, it, you know, create a yep. creative incubation period. Okay. Do you think that's possible? Yeah, yeah. But remember, sometimes incubation can just be, it can be just a freaking two or three seconds is all you need. And sometimes it's more. I, you know, one of the things, I, I studied a lot of, like I read a lot of biographies of like historical creative thinkers, and I noticed a lot of commonalities, and that's kind of how I put some of this together. But one of the things that I noticed is most creative thinkers were walkers. Like during the day they walk, and I've actually found that's really good. I've actually incorporated that, it's sometimes just a half hour, because it's walking, it's kind of like, it's similar to the shower thing where it's like, you know, it, you're doing a little bit, so you're a little bit distracted. Because just sitting in a room meditating, I can't, do, I don't know about you, but I can't do that. My mind will start playing tricks on me. But if I just have a very monotonous little thing to do, I find that really helps to incubate and helps to force the ideas up. Yeah. I mean, I've been with the company four years, and I'm, I'm not speaking to the Microsoft research folks, but my impression is that our culture, there's a lot of our culture is about uh, production. Everybody wants to be the artist creating the new uh -huh. Michelangelo sure. or something. Yeah. And so there's this massive push on production, but we don't have the requisite um, balance in terms of consumption. And so, which is what attracted me to come here today is, and I'm in consulting services, so I'm the, the flea on the back of the elephant as far uh -huh. as you know the broader Microsoft and the pro groups are concerned. The, the idea of of promoting consumption or borrowing people's ideas and building on them. And I feel like there's untapped potential both uh, in terms of hard IP that we have, but also the ideas that people have that we're not even scratching the tip of the iceberg on because we have this culture of recognition for artistic merit and production and not on consumption. Right. So I want to make sure that you guys don't take what I'm saying when I say taking ideas, I'm talking about taking the pieces of ideas, and it's not, I mean, just, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Another question kind of about Microsoft with this is, I think there's a lot written about the struggle of large companies to maintain an innovative environment. Mm -hmm. If I was gonna apply it to your rules, what I'd say is, um, judgment builds up over a period of time. There's kind of a Microsoft ways to do things, and there's businesses we're in and business models we follow. And something that doesn't fit that model oftentimes gets judged out. And I think another problem that large companies have is ideas don't get enhanced, they get thrown out. That well, yeah, I agree with that one. Ideas are doing that. Do you, like, what's your view on that? Do you see other large companies that do it? And when I hear you use Steve Jobs' as example, yeah. I kind of wonder for, you know, not every company is going to have Steve Jobs that individually <coughs> does that. Right. How do companies prevent from becoming too judgmental in the wrong way? and following through on enhancing ideas 
and not throwing them out too early in the process and kind of starting yeah. from scratch. Just yeah. to follow on for that, Xbox, I, I, I believe, originally was going to have the Windows operating system on it, and whoever it was convinced the powers that be that it shouldn't. Right. And that's why it's the success it is, because it was it persisted long enough to actually be successful outside the bounds of that judgment. So, right. I, I think an important part of the culture, like a creative culture, has to be that debate is um, um, encouraged and accepted and understood that it's constructive. Um, and I know, I don't, I don't know much about your culture now, but um, you know, I've studied like the early Microsoft, and I know that there was a lot of debating going on, and it was encouraged, and I'm not sure if you guys still do that, but that's a really, I mean, debate, because then you know. I mean, I, I, um, one, of the, one of the businesses that I started was a, um, uh, was a finance business, um, had nothing to do with high tech, um, but I had 300 salespeople. And I actually trained the 300 salespeople myself. And one of the things, and we, we hired kids out of college. And one of the things I learned early on um, that, or I noticed that people don't understand about selling is that in order to make a sale, you had to understand what the customer's objection was. So as a salesperson, the first thing you did was let's figure out what they're objecting to. So then I can, then I can present my solution to overcome that objective, but you can't do that until you know what the objection is. And I think of creative thinking the same way. It's like, I want the objection. Tell me what's wrong with it so that I can fix it. And again, um, when, I ever, when I get into the debate with people and I'm asking for feedback, when they tell me the negatives, I will always say, okay, now what do you like about it as well? Um, and that's because that's an important part. You know, judgment is not, in the creative process, judgment is not the acceptance or rejection of an idea. Judgment is telling me what I like about it and what I don't like about it. And you have to make, I think there's a difference. And debate is really good. You know, debate is a great way to do that. Yeah. How do you see um, managing timeline, timelines relative to the creative process? Yeah. Um, I think timelines are essential to the creative process. I think you need them. I mean, you need, because you need to move this stuff forward. If you have no timeline, I mean, I know like in my own experience, you know, the, the stronger timelines, even as it gets narrow, I get more creative. It forces me. So there is a force. So again, I don't want you, when I talk about this incubation period, um, you know, it can be really, really short, you know. Sometimes it's just a little... Today I'm going to deliver up that offer. <laughs> no, it's like, and just hope something comes up. And if it doesn't come up, then I go back to doing it consciously. Okay, what's the problem again? Where, where are my things? And I start, whenever I get stuck, I start, then I go to the first, uh, I go back to my steps. Um, that's why, I mean, I say that, like, you know, how, the order you do these things, and creativity is not really a six-step process, but there's value in thinking of it this way, for the reason that you were just talking about. Because once I get stuck, I'm like, okay, I've got nothing. Like in the shower this morning, nothing came out. So what do I, let me start with, what, what's my problem again? How can I maybe redefine and just, and just go down the list again? Yeah. On the borrowing uh, portion, yeah. do you see a correlation between sort of experience, age, other things, and the great innovators? If you look at like, you know, Sir Isaac Newton, I mean, there's somebody who was looking at all these different things so it's easier to borrow. Yeah. You are, you know, 14-year-old kid, even if you're brilliant, you have very little to borrow. Do you see a correlation in there? I, yeah, I do. Um, you know, one, again, I, I told you I studied a lot of, and read a lot of biographies. Well, you said 300 books or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of, but a lot of them were biographies, yeah. Yeah. you know. Um, and m most of the creative thinkers had a, had a wide, um, wide interest not just maybe in their specific domain. Didn't mean that they were like Da Vinci, like you know, being expert in every domain, but they, you know, they dabbled in other things. And maybe often related things, um, but just to kind of explore, to get those. Because you have, I mean, if you're going to borrow, that's why I like thinking about this then as a continuum. You know what I mean? Like, I, I stay close to home now. Now let me go way out. Where am I going to look? And it's the problem that's going to tell me where to look. You know, my, my daughter is, um, is um, studying fashion now. So I just bought a bunch of books on um, some fashion icons, and I was reading about um, uh, Coco Chanel. And Coco Chanel was a designer in the 19, she began like in the 1920s. Time Magazine called her one of the 
100 of the most influential people of last century. You know, this is a fashion designer. Um, and it's interesting to look, so I started looking at her story. And she did exactly what I'm talking about. She, first thing she did is she defined a problem. And her problem was the liberation of women. That's what she wanted to do. So once she had defined that problem, then she's like, okay, what materials, and no pun intended for this, for this example, but what materials am I going to use to solve that liberation problem? So what, what did she do? She went to men's clothing which made total sense, like, okay, if I am going to give women strength, where am I going to get that strength from? So what she did is she combined, you know, a man's suit with a, a woman's skirt, and that was the Chanel suit, and it kind of created that whole flapper thing, which really, and it did, and she, she made some huge changes, um, social changes. But again, it was like, barring, it was the problem that told her where to look for the solution. So when you borrow too much, for the interbank category, yeah. uh, do you have any legal issues? <laughs> Can you address any of this? Hey, you guys tell me that one, huh? <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you do. If you borrow an idea, make no adjustments like I was talking about, and use it to solve the exact same problem, you may have some legal issues on you. But you don't want to do that. I mean, one thing is in the beginning of my book, I looked at the history of creativity, like Renaissance, pre-Renaissance, and how they perceived creativity. Um, and they didn't think about it the way we do with like originality. There, weren't, there was no concepts of stealing ideas. As a matter of fact, stealing was encouraged. It wasn't about, it wasn't about the artist. It was about the piece of work. And you were expected to copy, but you were expected to copy and improve. And it was this. It wasn't until it wasn't until the artists started like getting away from the um, their patrons, and started like going out on their own that they're like, wait a minute, you know, they started signing things, you know. But pre pre Renaissance, you you will not find like in creative works, you don't know who the artist was because they didn't even conceive of that. It was all about borrowing, copying, improving, borrowing, copying, improving. And I think now. There's that, you know, we think that, oh my God, it's horrible, like, like that copying and creativity are opposites. But they're not. They're, they're rooted in exactly the same thing. And that's my message. <laughs> <laughs> so when we talk about innovation, we also talk about execution. Mm. Which sometimes is more important than innovation. I, I so totally agree with that. And... Um, um, this, my book, this book that you hold in your hands is about creative thinking. It's not about execution. My second book is about execution. <laughs> and how you, because you're right. I mean, you know, one of the things that I learned, again, studying creative people, and even with myself coming up with ideas, um, is you can't fall in love with the ideas themselves. You fall in love with the process, but you constantly want to improve them. So, one idea is like, you have to have like this apathetic relationship with ideas like, eh, you know, I can give it or, ta or take it or leave it. Because if you don't, once you love an idea, you've stopped the creative process and it never really stops. So, so in terms of arrangement of the topic <coughs> we were talking about earlier, incubation to me is the preliminary test of execution. So you put that somewhere in the middle. So I, I thought the incubation should be at the end of all this whole process. And if you don't I, work out, I have no idea where the end is, where the beginning is. It's, these are the elements. By the way, th this what I'm showing you here is that's not, this is just what I was talking about. Um, like, I don't think you can have, like I said, I don't think you can have an incubation meeting. Be, I guess it would be kind of, well, I mean, going for a hike is an incubation meeting, I guess. I don't know. Does that make sense? So don't, I don't want to misconstrue that. Yeah. This notion of, I mean, I think there's a theme of a diversity of thinking, right? Whether you, whether you um, establish that yourself by saying, I'm, I'm going to educate myself on related or distant things, right? That, yep. that fuels this process. From an organizational perspective, that would seem to argue for, gee, recruiting from fields far and wide hopefully Which, could be one of the single best things yeah, you could ever do. I agree. Do. I think you guys do some of that here, too. I know in Cambridge there were sociologists and anthropologists and all these different, which is great because that's what you're doing. You're going out to other domains and combining that in with the technology and with the other things. I'm not so sure we do that as much as the, the things that are in the productization level and the uh -huh. products where I think we might become more homogenous. And, and, right. and I think that's where some of the risk is, right? right. You know, my own career here at the time, 
what people think are the best ideas are literally just stuff like, well, you know, I used to work in a different industry and I could look at the problem right. and just say, that's familiar and that's how we solve it back there. Right. right. So. But I'm saying, like, let's be, I mean, be um, deliberate about it. Like, okay, here's my problem. Where do I go? Like, where, who's doing this? And, and this isn't a process that, like I, like, I invented. This is a the way the human mind works. This is an observation, you know? I mean, maybe the part I invented was, like, that part of, like, go keep going farther out, you know? But otherwise, this is, and you can find this type of process in a lot of different books and creative thinking books. Um, I think I take maybe a little bit more of a practical engineering kind of approach in that beginning thing, like, uh, really structure and making components and changing things out, but. If there are no more questions, we'll go ahead and sign books. And cool. You can always see, ask your questions individually as you get books signed. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, guys.